Hi, um, my name is John Royce. I'm a, a neurologist um, and um, I work here. This is um, Queen's Square um, and I work at um, uh, both of those places which are actually, uh, you can't see from the picture, but they're facing each other across the square. So um, at the top is the hospital, the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. And um, for the past um, uh, 10 years as a consultant and another 10 years before that, um, I run an afternoon clinic once a week where I see people with young onset um, atypical and genetic forms of neurodegeneration, particularly forms of, of dementia. Um, and then um, I spend half my time there and I spend half my time on the other side of the square at the Dementia Research Centre. Um, and I started there about 20 years ago, but before me, um, we have been studying families um, with um, forms of genetic neurodegeneration for over 30 years, nearly 40 um, years. And my PhD supervisor was someone called Martin Rosser, who started um, studies in uh, familial disease in the 1980s. Um, it means that we do have um, connections with families who we've seen over many generations. Um, and um, I'll come on to talk about the future and trials, but rather sadly, um, uh, I am now seeing often the third generation of families um, who've been to our research department over, over 20 or, or 30 years and families that we know very well. So um, I study this condition, um, which is frontotemporal dementia. Frontotemporal dementia accounts for probably about um, somewhere between 5 and 10% of all forms of dementia. When you um, have an onset below 60, it becomes about the most common form of dementia along with Alzheimer's disease. But it's a spectrum of, of conditions. And I put this slide up not to go through it really in detail, um, but just to say that it's complex. There are people that have um, uh, behavioral symptoms, there are people that have language symptoms, but it does, of course, overlap in about 10 to 15 percent of people with motor neuron disease or with ALS. And there are multiple different pathologies. The pathology is what's going on in the brain cells, and then multiple different genetic forms, some of which cause only FTD, some of which cause an overlap of FTD with motor neuron disease. And overall, about um, unlike motor neuron disease, a little bit more familial, about a third of people with FTD will have a familial form. So just that picture to just say that it is a complex disorder. But I'm here to talk about this study um, called GEMFI, or the Genetic FTD Initiative. Um, we've been going for just over 10 years now. And when I first started in the field, um, lots of individual centres around the world were doing very small studies in maybe three or four families, or bigger centres like ours might have had 10 or 15 families. And it seems slightly foolish not to all come together and think about how we do a bigger study. Um, but back in 2012, remarkably, the questions were, can we all work together? Um, can we study people in the same way? The answer to that has hopefully been yes. So um, if you come to our study in London or here in Oxford or in Manchester, then you get the same set of tests, exactly the same set of tests, um, if you're in Lisbon or Toronto or Madrid. And, and that's really the core to doing these kind of studies, is to make sure that what you're doing everywhere is the same set of data that allows us to study this condition. And we started off with only five centres um, back in 2012, but it has slowly grown over time. Um, so we ended up and we've slowly grown. 13 centres by the end of part one, 26 centres by the end of phase two, and yesterday um, we added our 47th um, centre into the study. And, and this is the study. So we account for virtually all of the centres um, within Europe, um, just by how we were funded initially. It was a Europe and Canadian funding stream, so we ended up having Canada um, involved in the study, not just Europe. But we go right from quite northern Finland um, all the way down now to Turkey, um, have become involved most recently, southern Italy, Portugal, right the way across um, Europe. And we're continually, continually adding new sites, so 16 
countries um, and 47 centres. So who's in the study? Well, um, there are people who have symptoms um, who are in the study, um, usually people that have very early symptoms of the condition. But actually the majority of people, as you will see, are people who don't have symptoms. And at the moment, we've been studying people from 18 onwards, um, but we're about to start a sub-study, as Martin was just mentioning, where actually we're going to start looking at people actually from the age of nine um, onwards. There are lots of complexities of that, there are lots of ethical issues around that, but things we've thought long and hard about over a number of years about how we might study people. Um, but the main part of the study is adults, but we will have a sub-study in, in um, uh, teenagers and people from the nine onwards. So, as I said, some of these forms of um, FTD um, only cause frontotemporal dementia and don't cause motor neuron disease. So particularly um, the genes GRN, progranulin, MAPT, tau, they almost never cause motor neuron disease. But as many of you know, and I, I, I recognize that many of you will be from families with the C9-Orf72 gene, um, that can cause both um, FTD and motor neuron disease, as can some of these less common causes, TBK1, TARDP, um, FUS. Interestingly, um, the SOD1 gene, which um, causes uh, um, motor neuron disease, really hardly ever causes um, FTD. So there are, along a spectrum, there are things that can cause only FTD, things that can only cause MND, and then really c 9 of 72 is, is the big one in the middle that can cause both. But um, what do people do when they come into the study? So I know you've heard this morning about um, the ACORN study, and lots of these studies are very similar. And I'll t tell you why we're doing these things um, in a minute. But really, the goal over the years has been to try and understand this condition better. So it involves hearing the story of what's happened, doing a physical exam, a memory exam, questionnaires, involves taking blood samples. For some people, not everyone likes having a lumbar puncture. Does anyone like having a lumbar puncture? Um, maybe not, but some people are happy to have it, um, helpful for the research. Some uh, psychology testing, brain imaging, um, MRI and PET in some people. And with the blood samples, we do some genetics. So that's what people do when they come into the study. And this has been our recruitment over time. So these are the three phases of the study. So across Europe and Canada, we have nearly 1,500 people in the study, and we have data from nearly 4,000 um, visits. And the recruitment has slowly grown um, over time. Um, and um, even um, really over COVID, um, some of our centres managed to keep going, some didn't, um, but, but we still managed to carry on going up. So when that splits into gene, and perhaps important here, is um, when we look at c 9 of 72 that's the most common um, genetic form of FTD in the same way it's the most common genetic form of motor neuron disease. And you can see that we have 157 um, symptomatic people some of whom have only FTD, some of whom have um, motor neuron disease as well. Um, but we also have um, uh, over 450 um, at-risk people. And of course, in some ways, we are um, uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, study of pre-symptomatic um, uh, motor neuron disease as well, because we don't know what those 453 people are, are going to develop. And unfortunately, we can't predict that currently. So some of those people will develop. Um, FTD and some of those people will develop motor neuron disease and some people will develop both. Just say we have a, a team, if I was, um, I've been to talks where the, 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 some of the big US groups uh, talk about their team and they might have about 40 people. Um, uh, UK studies often have a much smaller team but this is the entire team that deals with 1400 people coming in put them up to say thank you and to put our email up it's just gemfi at ucl.ac.uk if anyone's interested um, so and then we have a website which is gemfi.org so as I said we have nearly 1500 people recruited we've published lots of data and that's important if people are going to come and contribute their data to this um, then it's important to use that data for science. And so we um, do our best to make use of every single bit of data that comes through. 
There's no point collecting it if we're not going to publish on it. And those publications are always open access, available on the website, so for people to come and, and read. So that means that we can always um, get out what we've done in terms of science. And I'll talk to you about how we feed back that research in a minute. And I'll talk a little bit about our third phase where we've thought a little bit more about remote testing and I'll also talk a bit about how we've worked um, with people around the world. But I thought I'd, I'd talk a little bit about UK Genfi and this will overlap with some of the other talks that you've heard today but from a, a slightly different perspective. So within the UK, how do people end up um, in the study? So at the moment we have, as you might have seen if you looked very closely on the previous slide, there are four um, centres um, that see people within the UK. So here, um, UCL in London, Manchester um, and in Cambridge. And we have a network of neurology and psychiatry and genetics clinics throughout UK and also Ireland um, who will um, refer people to us usually at the point at which somebody who's developed symptoms um, has... Um, uh, uh, been found to have a genetic cause and then often we'll end up seeing that family but sometimes the clinical genetics team will send us people who've had predictive testing. So family members do sometimes follow that similar path and I'll show you what that pathway is. Um, so we've also had a little bit of a think about genetic testing and actually um, what I put up is one slide from what was a, a very long study um, where we did what's called a Delphi consensus study. It's where you get a set of professionals and other people to make a consensus about what they think should be done in terms of testing. And uh, you'll hear this again, perhaps people in this room don't need to be said, the importance of offering genetic testing. Not everyone has to take it up. And you heard very nicely in the previous talk about how to make that, um, that decision. But this is who should be offered testing. And, and we're moving to an era where actually the majority of people, so certainly all, uh, the outcome of this study yet to be published is that we think that all people that have the behavioral form of FTD, people that have FTD with motor neuron disease, here written as FTD ALS, and people with some of the forms of the language variants should all be offered testing. That is no way current practice in, in the UK at all, certainly not, not, not current practice anywhere. But these are guidelines that we hope um, will get published soon and hopefully that will stimulate more um, offering of genetic testing. It doesn't mean you have to take that up. Um, but certainly that, that, that practice is poor and certainly I get lots of people who've found us online and come to our clinic because they've heard um, that, that maybe FTD and maybe FTD ALS overlap could be genetic, having not been told that at their clinic. So this is the kind of pathway um, that um, we have set up over the years, really to get into, into GEMFI. Um, and um, either a person in the family with symptoms is tested for and they're diagnosed, um, and then often the family members are told of their risk. and, and Often family members are told in their, uh, of their risk because they've come along to the appointment and they're told that their risk is 50%. But we have plenty of people who have had someone come to their door and tell them that a family member um, uh, has been diagnosed with FTD or ALS and that they're at risk or sometimes in a letter to them. But once that happens, we try to um, uh, put this whole thing into, into um, practice. So I'll tell you in a minute a little bit about the monthly clinic that we run and that's really where we pick up all family members um, and try to triage them into our different services. So that sits in the middle, this familial clinic. So we link them with our support group, which I'll talk to you about. Sometimes we refer them onto clinical genetic services. For most people, we will try and filter them somewhere into psychological support, and we will talk about research. That's by and large the observational research study, GEMFI, which I'm mainly talking about, but nowadays it's also into clinical trials. And I'll talk about, we talk about these other things. We talk a bit about support, financial, legal care support. We talk a little bit about predictive testing. So that's the pathway, and some of those are back and forth. Some people have come to us through our support group. Some people have come to us through genetic services. But we try to offer this comprehensive service to at-risk family members. So the research clinic is something we've been running for about two years. It's a monthly clinic. I will see people virtually. It's a virtual clinic over video. 
Um, it's the last Friday of every month. It's only for asymptomatic at-risk family members. It's not for people with symptoms. They come to my NHS um, clinic. People can self-refer. Very happy for people just to email us. It's not an NHS clinic. Um, and before clinic, people get a whole pack of information. It's about 16 pages, all about familial FTD, m and about genetic counselling, about our study, about our support group. And in that 45 to 60 minutes, we talk to people about their family tree. We talk about some general information. We talk about whether they've had pre testing or not. We talk sometimes a little bit about pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. We talk about our research. We talk about what trials are happening. We link people in with our support group. Um, and importantly, um, we um, now link them in with clinical psychology support. Um, and um, in recent years, members of the GEMFI study have been involved in developing a targeted clinical psychology support program based on acceptance and commitment theory, kind of third generation CBT, um, which is a very targeted program really for people living at risk um, of a familial form um, of FTD. Um, and that program has been developed by one of our PhD students and has just got to the point where we're about to start running it. So um, you heard very kindly from the last speaker about our website. It's the website that our team use. Um, it uh, updates on our research, but actually it's also lots of fact sheets about FTD um, and about living at risk um, and uh, lots of the things that I'm talking about today. There's lots on our website um, about that. Um, and importantly, um, uh, this is a group that um, actually has been going in, in one form or another for actually, actually over 25 years. Um, it started as the so-called PICS disease support group. PICS disease is a sort of old-fashioned name for FTD, for frontotemporal dementia. But over the years, um, we have brought together about six or seven different support groups under the umbrella of rare dementia support. And within the FTD field, we have specific support groups for people with FTD, people with um, the language form, primary progressive aphasia. Um, and those are really targeted at people living with dementia and their carers. And then there's also a familial group, and that's really targeted um, at people living at risk. Um, and that's a group that meets in person in a large group once a year. Um, and then more recently, we started quite small peer support groups. We have a small peer support group of pe people who've recently living at risk, who've been given a, a genetic diagnosis of carrying the mutation. And I know lots of our um, people have found that really helpful. It's a very small group, four or five people sharing their experience. And we have those small support groups for other things like people um, living with caring for people in the late stage um, and for different stages of the illness. Our team can also provide individual calls to members for support on any topic um, at all. Um, and um, we now run, as I said, this clinical psychology support services very targeted um, at um, these very specific conditions with lots of knowledge from our psychologists about these conditions. We are soon just um, uh, um, just received some funding. We're going to be a physical centre in London. We're going to be the first, world's first, hopefully, rare dementia centre. Hopefully, going to be run a bit like one of the Maggie centres for cancer. But that'll be that's our sort of next big thing for this group. So that's a little bit of how about how you end up into into Gemfi. Um, and really, what we want is by people coming by the time people come into research, they really have an idea of this condition and why they're coming into the research and, and the reason uh, uh, why it's so important. But coming down for a visit, we see people on a yearly or if you're very young on a two yearly basis and you've heard what we do. It takes about 10 till four in the day, clinical and cognitive assessment, some imaging, blood sample. But it's also a chance to catch up with the team. 95% of the time that's with me, um, finding out about research updates and trials. We usually have a chance to discuss psychological support and onward referrals and often over the years. So um, within GEMFI, um, you, can be, you can come into GEMFI whether you know your genetic status or not. Um, about um, one third of people in the study know that they are either a carrier or not a carrier. 70% of people in the study do not know whether they carry the mutation or not, and that's fine, and we include all people within the study. And over the years, people change their minds about whether they want to know or don't know. 
You heard the most important phrase in the last talk, which I say um, similarly to all people. You cannot unknow the information um, about your genetic status and people's views change um, over time. You heard that very nicely just before. So what are the um, core aims um, of GEMFI? Well, um, I started doing this study when there were no treatments even in development, um, but we're now at a stage where um, trials are starting in these conditions. And really our goal has always been two core questions, which is how do we best measure the earliest change in the disease? And really that question is, when are we going to treat people? Are we going to treat people when they first develop symptoms? Are we going to treat people five years before? Or are we going to treat them from the age of 18 onwards? That's a complex question. And how do we measure disease progression, the progression of disease? And really that's the same question as how are we going to know the treatments have worked? So when we give a drug, are we going to know whether um, this treatment that we're giving is working? So really it's all about how we're designing a therapeutic trial. And the way to do that is what I would call biomarkers, markers of biological disease. And in the wider sense, that includes all the measures of the things that we're doing in a study. So it may be that the way that we know when to treat people, well, that might be an MRI scan, but the way we know that the drug is working is a blood test or a spinal fluid test. And those might be different things. And so um, important that we do this kind of wide set of tests because we don't have a complete answer to how we would do that. So I'm going to show you just a couple of slides, not too much on, on the science and um, what we've done. One of the important things that we need to think about is how we might do a trial. And in some ways, it's easy to do a trial of people that have symptoms. Um, that's people who come to our clinic. We make a diagnosis of FTD or motor neuron disease or both. Those people are, are going to be able to go into a, a trial if they're eligible for it. What's going to be harder and what we've spent a long time thinking about is um, how we might do a preventative trial. So in other diseases, um, often there's a quite tight correlation between the age at which someone develops symptoms and the age at which their parent developed it, or the average age of everyone in the family. And then you can predict when people might develop symptoms. And then you can do a trial and say, well, actually, look, I'm going to include everybody within five years of likely onset of symptoms or within 10 years of likely onset of symptoms or 20 years. And this was a large study we did looking, and I focused just on the c 9 of 72 gene. And this is the correlation, so the association between the age at which somebody develops symptoms, whether that's FTD or motor neuron disease um, or both, and the age at which their parents developed it on the left um, and the average age of the family on the right. And what you can see is, well, these numbers here, if it was one, it would be perfect. So you develop symptoms at the age at which your parents developed it. If it was zero, that would mean there was no association at all. So the number here is 0.3. So that's at the lower end. That means there isn't a very great correlation. You can see that there's a very scattered um, set of dots here. And what that tells us is that although there's a little bit of an association, it isn't very good. And many of you probably will have been told that, which we're not very good at predicting the age at which people might develop symptoms um, uh, based on um, the age at which parents develop it or the age um, at which people, the average age of the family. And this was the biggest study to show that. So when we're designing a trial, we need to find other ways to work out how close people are to, um, to developing symptoms. And then, remarkably, I mean, it's very nice to talk today um, because I get to talk to a different group of people um, than I normally talk to. And you would think, remarkably, that there were lots of meetings where um, people, um, researchers um, in the motor neuron disease field and researchers in the FTD field all come together. But remarkably, um, there are fewer than you would think. Um, and there's still often two tracks of research. And remarkably, the main kind of way that we measure symptoms in FTD until recently has not included motor changes, 
remarkable. Um, and it hasn't included um, changes which I might call neuropsychiatric changes. So we know some people develop some strange symptoms of hallucinations and delusions. So that ends up with a slightly strange thing. So on the right, you see two pictures on the left of that bit. So sort of here, where this green is, um, this is the old scale, and on the right is the new scale. And these are all people with symptoms. And yet, when we score people on that symptom scale, naught means you have naught sim uh, no symptoms. And the green here is no symptoms. But that's obviously not true, because these people have motor neuron disease or FTD with motor neuron disease. These people have a form of Parkinson's-like illness. And so there might have been people, and that's still happening now, who would enter a trial and they might have FTD, but then later develop motor neuron disease, and yet those motor symptoms are not being measured in the trial. So it's really important that we come together as a field, and we've developed this new scale on the right, which now incorporates those symptoms into the same scale, and that was all developed in GEMFI. And then we also need to think about how we might measure changes in thinking. Um, and what we have shown is that the earliest change in thinking is not just in one bit of thinking. So some people will develop changes in the way they make decisions or the way they plan things. And other people might get changes in being able to remember things or remember the names for things. And all this picture is really showing is that when you try to design a trial, you have to kind of bring multiple tests together. And those tests actually are different across different genetic forms, but it's much better if you bring multiple tests together rather than one. So that's kind of measuring what's happening from the point of view of um, symptoms and from thinking. But we can also measure the loss of cells over time. And this is just um, a kind of summary of um, brain scans and the changes that you see over time. And I sort of draw your attention to particularly the, the picture on the left, which are people that carry the C9 or 72 expansion. And the red is the areas of the brain that we can see that are starting to lose brain cells even before people develop any symptoms. The orange is just when people have very mild symptoms and the yellow are when people have symptoms. So that's going to be important. It means the MRI will be an important measure that we have in trials because those red areas we can start to measure even before people develop symptoms. And then maybe that will be a way then of knowing when people might go into a trial the earliest time that we can measure cell loss on an MRI scan. But now we start to develop other ways of measuring cell loss. And we have this blood test, which many of you who have been involved in research will have heard about, um, called NFL, or neurofilament light. It's a very sort of general measure across multiple neurological diseases in the context of these diseases, it's probably around loss of brain cells or loss of cells in general. Um, and interestingly, this study on the left, what it shows is um, uh, the people um, on, the, I'm not going to point there because you can't all see that, um, but in the uh, people in the left-hand bar, they're people that don't have any, any uh, don't carry the, the um, mutation. Um, the next people are people that don't have symptoms. And then the people in the third um, bar along, they're people who have gone from developing symptoms to, develop, um, gone from no symptoms to developing symptoms. And you can see there's this big increase um, in this measure, the NFL. So we started to think about, well, maybe this measure, the NFL, is telling us something about when people are gonna develop symptoms. And you saw from age, was not a great measure of knowing just your age and the age at which your parents or other members of the family developed symptoms. That isn't a good measure of when you will do it. So maybe NFL will be useful. And this study on the right was a study which looked at if you had a high or low level 
were you someone who then developed symptoms over the next few years? And this study showed that you were likely to be. So um, the top is one study and the um, bottom is actually from the Gemfi study. And what it shows, that red line are the people who had a high level um, at their first measure and the blue were people that had a low measure of this NFL. And what you can see is this measure of clinical change of symptoms, it increases only in those that had a high NFL level. So we're starting to think about how we might use this in trials, in clinical practice, and um, that the NFL measure might be a predictor that you are likely to develop symptoms sometime soon. Lastly, we'll actually we'd also like to measure what's happening in the cells. And we don't have that great measures for that, those at the moment. Here are two that we do have. Well, in FTD, we have this measure progranulin, which measures whether you have a progranulin mutation, and we measure that in blood. And then in C9 of 72, we have this measure in, in spinal fluid, sometimes called DPRs or dipeptide repeats, which you can see are raised in people even before they have symptoms. On the left, we have the controls, and on the right, we have people that either have no symptoms or have symptoms. And that's raised even early on. So that will be perhaps a good measure to tell us what's happening in the cells. So that's just a few scientific studies from GEMFI, just to say that, that our goal is really to think about the best way of running trials. Who gets into the trial? When do we start treatments? How do we know whether the, the trial is working or not? But I just wanted to finish talking about our participants. So out of the 1,400 participants around Europe and Canada, we developed a kind of engagement board um, of people that were interested, like yourselves, who, who were wanted to be part of the study and wanted to kind of um, help us a bit more. And those people come to our investigator meetings. I'll talk about what the FPI is in a, mi in a minute. They have helped us develop a lot of the new tasks moving forward, and we've co-developed those things. And actually, as I was reminded at lunchtime, lots of our participants have also co-developed that psychological support program. And it's been developed through a set of nearly 20 interviews with our participants, the psychology support program, who've talked about what they want and what they want at different stages along the way. And actually, our participants have been amazing. They've linked with pharma companies. They've given talks to pharma companies about what they want from trials. They've sat on advisory boards um, for new drug developments. And we have a really um, amazing participant engagement board. And I wanted just to leave you with a couple of issues which have been identified by our participants. And, and we put into a review recently, we, we had a whole section just on what our participants thought of, of um, studies. So, one question that comes up is, well, how often should I be assessed? You're only seeing me every year. Do I need to be seen a bit more than that? And these are, these are direct quotes from people. So someone said, well, actually, I really want to help with research. But actually, the research visit reminds me that I might develop this condition. I, I want to forget about it for the other 364 days of the year. So I'm happy coming once a year. I don't want you to come and, and do anything else with me. Whereas someone else has said, well, actually, and this perhaps is more as you get a bit older, people have said, well, actually, I'd like to have more regular tests done. Maybe I want something every few months um, to, so I know what's going on and then I can perhaps join a trial. So there are definitely different views on how often people want to be seen. How do we best measure the potential onset of symptoms? So that's, a, you know, when we talk about developing motor symptoms, that's often the person themselves that might develop it. But behavioural symptoms are a little bit different. People often don't have complete insight into developing symptoms. And traditionally, what we've done is ask the partners of people, has this person changed? Is their behaviour changing? And interesting, of course, actually, times have changed. You know, perhaps we were a bit more paternalistic in research in years gone by, and we just did what we thought was good. But actually what, what we hear and what we've, we have recently co-developed into a new rating scale um, is actually people say, well, actually, I don't want my partner. I don't want you asking my partner if I, am I a bit more disinhibited than I was or am not telling me about that. I don't think that's right. So I think, and this is a good, I think this is a good quote. I worry that maybe it might reflect something I wasn't aware of. Maybe it'll overemphasize. Maybe I said something a bit funny once and they'll overemphasize that. So I, I think that's, that's a really important um, reflection on um, how our participants feel to what we're doing. 
And then this comes back a little bit to this question of, um, I've used the word phenoconvert here, sorry, I didn't change it for this slide. Phenoconvert means developing symptoms, going from no symptoms to symptoms. So how do we assess whether people develop symptoms? Now, that was the issue I've talked a few times about, which is maybe age isn't that good. And maybe we can use this, word, this measure, the NFL. Now, interestingly, in a study of progranulin mutations, that's a mutation that only causes FTD, doesn't cause motor neuron disease. One drug company has included um, people who carry the mutation who've yet to develop any symptoms. You go into the study, you get screened, and if your NFL is high, you go into the study. If it is low, you don't go into the study. Now, my experience of this has been mixed, and some have said, I'm really glad that I know my NFL is high. That means I'm likely to develop symptoms. I can plan for things I really want to know. But for others, it has been a terrible thing. It's created a huge amount of anxiety. And here's a quote from someone. I'm glad to be involved in a trial now, but I really wish I had not, didn't have to, hadn't had to find out my NFL level. I'm continuously on the lookout for symptoms now, even more so than they were before. So, you know, we can develop things that we think are good in science, but it's important to apply that to an individual person and think about what the fallout might be to an individual person. And actually, I've ended up, we've ended up doing a lot more psychological support around measuring NFL than I thought perhaps even I, I, I thought we might have to do. So lastly, I think on my last slide, we, we've been, we do surveys all the time. We ask participants, do you want to be in our study? Do you not? You know, what do we do wrong? What do we do right? Um, and this was really about trials. So um, this was about trials because some trials involve regular lumbar punches. We don't ask people to. It's very optional in GEMFI. Um, and interestingly, of course, here, you know, will you be willing to have regular lumbar punches to be in a trial? About a third of people say, I'll have as many as needed. Not sure I'd have as many as needed, but um, and 30% of people say, no, they, they absolutely don't want to have it. So, it's, you know, that's difficult because a lot of new drugs might require that. And then we've talked about, well, what would you have? Would you have an intravenous drug? Actually, most people will have some form of an intravenous drug. Although 13% of people said no. Would you have a drug that you inject into your neck, a place called the cisterna magna? And that's happening in FTD. We are involved in a couple of gene therapy trials. About two thirds of people said yes, one third no. And we're about to start a, a trial where we will be injecting the gene therapy directly into the brain. And understandably, fewer people would want to be involved in that. About half and half of people would want to do that or not. But this is the future, and it's a change even for me. I've run observational studies for many years. But we are getting to the stage where we're going to be doing drugs that will be very invasive. They might be into the back with viral lung puncture. They might be intravenous. But they might be into the neck or into the brain. And we have to think about who's going to do that. We have to prepare and prepare through it jointly with our participants to do that. Um, so lastly, um, the FPI, that's actually bringing together GEMFI with a whole set of other similar studies around the world. And actually, it's been one of the most enjoyable things that I've done in recent years is to link GEMFI with other centers. We now have this worldwide database of people living at risk of familial FTD, many people living at risk of familial ALS. Across all these studies, we have nearly 1,000 people living at risk of C9 or 72. Um, in the study. So there's a big study in the, in the US called All FTD, a study in South America called REDLAT, in Australia and New Zealand, and then we've recently included a whole set of centers across Asia, and we have this amazing set of people across the world involved in that. What are we doing new? Well, actually, COVID really hit us. We had to stop for a little while. And one of the things we've done in the last few years is think, well, actually, not all our participants want to come to a big city. Um, to be involved in the study. Maybe we can do things more remotely. So we've co-developed this kind of digital study, wearable things, trying less invasive blood sampling. It means you don't have to come to our research center every year. And so we have this study, this digital biomarker study, where we do these kind of cognitive tests, some on a phone, some on an iPad, some using eye tracking. We do speech analysis that you record into your phone. We get people to wear Fitbits. And then also, actually, we're interested in motor function. Are people going to develop motor neuron disease? And so we're starting to do things like surface EMG, muscle ultrasound, gait assessment, 
all part of a kind of a, a study where actually you can do all of this at a distance in someone's home. We actually have a way of doing blood sampling now just via a finger prick. And hopefully at some point you might even be able to do portable MR imaging. So there is an MRI you can stick in the back of a van. It's a quarter of a million pounds, we don't have one yet. Um, but I, what is clear is these are relatively rare conditions, certainly FTD is really important to work with families and patients and industry and academia in order to get to our final goal. Our goal is to provide the best science, the best opportunities for patients and families, and eventually lead to a cure for this illness. I just say thank you to everyone, particularly all the participants, some of whom are here, thank you, um, and um, all the carers, all the family members who take part in the study, and my big wider team, thank you very much.